Um, today, uh, we are going to be talking about the theme of faith and reason. In fact, I didn't do this last week because I've been having trouble settling on, on how I wanted to tackle a couple of these classes. This, I think, is going to be our outline for the, the, this week and the next six weeks after this one. Today we're going to talk about faith and reason. This is because one of the accusations that the new atheists make against people of faith, especially Christians, but you know, Richard Dawkins causes, calls anybody who has faith a faith head. <laughs> so he's dismissive in the terms of calling them faith heads. Um, it's like a pothead, I don't know. And so today we're going to talk about why we believe that faith and reason are not incompatible. In fact, they're very consistent in that the, the definitions and the assumptions made by the new atheists are simply inaccurate. Um, I said in the lecture today that when we get into these discussions, people get, believe they're right because they agree with their conclusions and they don't know enough about logic to take a step back and say, are their propositions correct? Because propositions are the product, I mean, uh, conclusions in logic are the uh, correct result of proper propositions, you know, the, the sort of terms by which you set up the argument. And consistently, the new atheists have wrong propositions. Um, and so today we're going to talk about that a little bit. I, in case I don't forget it, in case I forget it later, I mentioned this recently, and I don't know if it was in class or not. But one of the videos I watched where Christopher Hitchens is talking, he is making this big deal. One of his major messages is that Christianity is immoral, and he says Christianity is immoral because it's based upon the idea that having tortured and killed an itinerant preacher two thousand years ago, that that was appropriate in order for us to receive atonement. And he said, our atonement, because of the torture and death of somebody else 2,000 years ago, is immoral, and we shouldn't accept it. Well, he would be right, except he's got a fundamental error in his proposition, and that is, he wasn't just an itinerant preacher. He wasn't just a man. If you make the assumption that he was, <clears throat> and that it was done to him, then the conclusion that it is immoral is probably correct. But if instead your, your proposition includes the idea, and here we get into presuppositional issues I'm going to talk about later. If your presupposition includes the idea that this was not just a man, he was God himself, and that he voluntarily sacrificed himself, he had the power to stop it if he wanted, but he chose to have that happen for our sake, that change in the propositions of the argument fundamentally changed the conclusion you draw. And so a lot of what the, the new atheists have done is they define things in way that are, ways that are uncalled for and unacceptable and not consistent. I'm going to quote Terry Eagleton later um, about reading Dawkins' uh, version of theology is ridiculous. The guy has no clue about theology or philosophy. And when he tries to talk, he's a scientist. <clears throat> when he tries to talk about either one, he sounds really silly to anybody who knows those things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today, faith and reason. Next week, we're going to talk about science and origins. The new atheists are entirely based their principles on the fact that evolutionary biology explains everything. And so you don't need faith. So origins, the origin of humanity, the origin of the universe, and science. And they claim that that's completely inconsistent with any sort of religious views. Then we're going to talk about morality, suffering, and violence. They claim that Christianity or any religion, especially the monotheistic religions, are immoral. That they, are the, that they are the cause of all the suffering and all the violence in history. And that if we got rid of religion, hum, human race would be in great shape. Then naturalism and supernaturalism, the issue of is it only the physical world or how do we understand beyond the physical world and why is it that humanity is always both desired and believed that there is something beyond the physical world. Then the influence of religion, has it really been so negative? And on November 13th, we'll talk about arguments for God. What are the logical arguments for God? And we have a number of people um, that, that in recent years, when they finally just boiled it all down, they said, uh, you know, like uh, Anthony Flew, he, uh, we, Pilar, we've got chairs up here. Come right up here and pull a chair up. These guys can make room for you. Um, right behind you, get Larry, right here. Um, there were people in the lecture who turned those chairs around in order to sit on the center table, so, um, uh, who was a, a philosopher and scientist who has always been an atheist, and he recently, as a scientist, recently looked, um, he's in his 90s, and he looked at all the evidence and he finally said, you know, when I'm honest with this, I can't believe this all happened by chance. So he did not become a Christian or a theist, but he did become a deist. Who's this? Uh, Anthony Flew. Uh, and just 
the atheists hate it, hate it when something like that happens. But there have been a lot who have made that shift when they finally got honest about what it is they saw. And a lot of that has to do with arguments for God. And then the conclusion and the final exam. As always, on the fifth or sixth week, I will give you what you need to know uh, about this class to study and to take the test. You should study and take the test, even if you're not doing it for credit. I saw that look, Lydia. Uh, because you'll learn more. Okay, very simply. Any questions about that? Where we're going? I reserve the right to change this uh, at any time. <laughs> Because as I, as I work on this, it's been, there's so many pieces of it, and they're so interwoven, interlocked, it's very difficult. I will tell you that today, I am going to be leaning very, very heavily, you might say I'm going to blatantly steal, the work of John C. Lennox, who has written a very good book called Gunning for God, Why the New Atheists Are Missing the Target. And if you, if you listen to my lecture, and then you go back and read Gunning for God by John Lennox, you'll say, Ross just stole all this guy's stuff. <laughs> well, I confess that right up front. He does a really good job of presenting this stuff, the quotes he has and everything else, and you, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I give him full credit for it. And I'm not charging you anything for this, so uh, it's not like I'm getting, making money off of it. So, okay. As we said last week, we have a mandate for why we're doing this. In 1 Peter 3, we read, But in your hearts, revere Christ says, Lord, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That's, I'm going to use that before every class because that's the foundation by which we do apologetics, by which we consider what are the reasonable arguments or explanations for our faith. We are to give a reason for the hope that we have. But we're going to do it, unlike the new atheists, we're going to do it with gentleness and respect. Okay. Um, and R.C. Sproul, again, a great quote, the defense of the faith is not a luxury or an intellectual vanity. It is a task appointed by God that you should be able to give a reason for the hope that is in you as you bear witness before the world. That's why we have classes in apologetics. Plus, those of you who want to get a certificate or a degree, you get credit for it. All right? So today, we're talking about um, faith versus reason. Michael Onfray is one of the new atheists. He wrote a book called In Defense of Atheism. And in it, he says this, A fiction does not die. An illusion never passes away. A fairy tale does not refute itself. You cannot kill a breeze, a wind, a fragrance. You cannot kill a dream or an ambition. I don't think I agree with a lot of that, but anyway, that's what he said. God, manufactured by mortals in their own quintessential image, exists only to make daily life bearable, despite the path that every one of us treads towards extinction. We cannot assassinate or kill an illusion. In fact, illusion is more likely to kill us. And here's the point here. For God puts to death everything that stands up to him, beginning with reason, intelligence, and the critical mind. All the rest follows in a chain reaction. So, I give you this quote because Onfray, like a lot of the new atheists, believe, first, that God's a fiction. He's not real. But then, that this fictional God that has been created by people, the God of the Bible, is actually um, committed to destroying human reason, to destroying any reasonable or rational understanding. I mean, he says that. He puts to death everything that stands up to him, beginning with reason, intelligence, and the critical mind. Well, the problem is, once again, they, you know, they set up a false dichotomy here, or a false case. They put, to, put up a straw man. The God of the Bible is most distinctly not a God who is opposed to reason. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the New Testament is quoted by Jesus, that you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. In the Christian ethics class, we talk about the fact that ethics, that the Jews had the first ethics 4,000 years ago, um, that Jewish philosophy, both earlier on and then through the Middle Ages, was very significant. Um, natural law theology that Thomas Aquinas, the Catholic theologian, came up with that is still you know, the, the source for Catholic ethical behavior and a lot of other parts of Catholicism. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was the most important Catholic theologian in history. Aquinas was significantly influenced by Maimonides, and Maimonides was significantly influenced by Aristotle. So my point is the religious thought, the, the, the intellectual, philosophical, 
work that has been done down through the centuries by people who were Jewish or Christian or religious has always been very heavily oriented toward intellectual pursuits and reason. When somebody like Christopher Dawkins, or I'm sorry, Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens, Ditchens, when they make comments about how everybody who doesn't agree with them is stupid, I go, I'm sorry, but who are you to compare yourself to Thomas Aquinas or Augustine of Hippo or, you know, Sir John Polkinghorne or any of the rest of these great, brilliant minds, these geniuses down through history who have absolutely believed in the truth of Jesus Christ. Do they really think they're that much smarter than those guys? And that God is committed to destroying reason? God is the one who made human reason. The biblical view of humanity is that we are the highest level of God's creation. And our rationality is part of that, which is why we're told to use our mind as we seek God. Um, so this idea, this, this is a straw man, this false idea that religion, and especially Christianity, because they talk about the God of the Bible a lot, that, that Christianity or Judaism or Islam, the monotheistic religions, are completely irrational and against reason. There is no foundation for that. Historically, biblically, it is a false idea. Okay? But that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's back up from that and say, um, what is faith? Lennox, very appropriately, goes to the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the official dictionary of the English language. I mean, it is the one, above all others, that defines what words mean. It's the two-volume, big two-volume one. And the two-volume one that comes in a box, the print's so small it comes with its own magnifying glass. It is a huge thing. The Oxford English Dictionary is the, the source for what the English language means. It defines the word faith as being from the Latin word fides, which is from which we get the word fidelity, and it means trust or reliance. It also, additional definitions within the Oxford English Dictionary, are belief, trust, confidence, that which produces belief, evidence, token, pledge, engagement, trust in its objective aspect, truth, um, observance of trust, or fidelity. Fidelity means reliable. Okay, it's, To have faith is to believe something is reliable. Now, Richard Dawkins, especially, of all the new atheists, insists that atheists do not have faith. Scientific belief, I'm quoting him here, this is from the God Delusion, scientific belief is based upon publicly checkable evidence. Religious faith not only lacks evidence, its independence from evidence is its joy, shouted from the rooftops. Dawkins is establishing, well, let me give you another one. Dawkins says, a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, but harder to eradicate. Faith being belief that isn't based on evidence is the principal vice of any religion. So Richard Dawkins here is drawing a very clear distinction between scientific belief and religious faith. He has no justification for doing that from any academic definition of what faith is. If you look at those definitions up there from the Oxford English Dictionary, the dictionary, I'm going to give you another dictionary in a minute. The idea that you trust or rely on, that you have confidence in, that you uh, trust the objective, notice objective, not subjective, aspect of something. What do scientists do with the evidence that they find in science, if not that? How could they ever propose a theorem or a hypothesis or, you know, a stab, you know, write a paper saying this is what we found with our research if they were not willing to say that they had confidence in it? or they trusted in the objective nature or aspects of what they were presenting. When Dawkins and the other new atheists say that faith is unjustified because it is based on no evidence at all, in fact, it, it is opposed to evidence, they are drawing a false definition that is not defensible from any source. They have made it up. So they set it up as a straw man and then they shoot it down. Um, Back to Michael Onfray, who I quoted a second ago. He accuses religious believers of, quote, unbelievable credulity, which means allowing yourself to be fooled, 
unbelievable credulity because they do not want to see the evidence. Um, another atheist who writes quite a bit is Julian Baggini. Baggini says, the atheist position is based on evidence and arguments to best explanation. The atheist believes in what she has good reason to believe in and doesn't believe in supernatural entities that there are few reasons to believe in, none of them strong. He has not done his homework. Go back and watch the apology, first apology of class. If this is a faith position, then the amount of faith required is very small. Meaning, you know, well. Contrast this with believers in the supernatural. We can see what a true faith position is. Belief in the supernatural is belief in what there is a lack of strong evidence to believe in. To believe in. The status of atheist and religious belief are thus quite different. Only religious belief requires faith, because only religious belief postulates the existence of entities which we have no good evidence to believe exist. So what the new atheists have done here is they have redefined faith as being entirely unjustified. In fact, it is a refusal to look at the, even look at the evidence, much less accept it as opposed to scientific belief, which they believe is based on the evidence. Um, so, neither of those things are justified in anything other than their own conclusions about what faith means. That is not the definition of faith. The suggestion that faith is always and only to be defined as something that is, un un there's no evidence for, that is unwarranted, and we'll talk about warranted later, is entirely something they made up. So when you read all those comments about the negative parts of faith, like all this, you need to understand that. Their definition of faith is not held by anybody else. Yes? Explain to me, how does that square with, with Hebrews 11.1, 1, where the apostle, the river of Hebrews says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right. How does that square? There's more... There's more kinds of evidence than what you can see as part of it, all right? And I'm going to get to that. In fact, the interpretation that Bag uh, Baggini and others... So you would include evidence as being the non-tangible evidence? Right, or even, you know, I, I didn't see Jesus. I didn't see Paul. I didn't see Jesus walk on water. I didn't. But I have the testimony of people who are prepared to give their lives for that. That's evidence. Yeah. So there is more evidence than that. In, in fact, I'll get to... Uh, Julian uh, Beghini and uh, A.C. Gray, they both have commentary on the, the Thomas, the Doubting Thomas scene. We'll talk about that exactly then, and we'll talk about what is warranted belief, meaning what is evidence. Um, when Jesus said to Thomas, you know, blessed are you for believing, but even more blessed are those who will believe without seeing. Okay. You believe because you've seen. We'll, we'll talk about that. So there is other kinds of evidence. Um, so, what is faith? Again, this is from the uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary Online. And I'm, I'm giving you this in order to, to give a little credibility. Again, we're going to be fair. We're going to be respectful because we're told to be. The Merriam-Webster Online says that faith is an allegiance to or duty to a person. It's loyalty. You know, he kept his faith in me or, you know, in his responsibilities. It means fidelity to one's promises, sincerity of intentions, belief and trust in and loyalty to God, Belief in the traditional doctrines of a religion. And B1 is firm belief in something for which there is no proof. That's the definition they rely on. But how far down the list does that come? And it doesn't appear in most dictionaries. Uh, it means complete trust. Rather than going to the Oxford English Dictionary, or even Merriam-Webster, I think, um, the atheists have based their understanding of faith on Huckleberry Finn. Mark Twain... I think it was Huckleberry Finn. It may have been Tom Sawyer. Mark Twain, because I know this quote from there. Mark Twain wrote, Faith is belief in what you know ain't true. That's why the ain't is in there, because it was Huck Finn. Um, the atheists have taken that kind of belief, and they have based all their understanding on faith is, is on that. It is believing something contrary to the evidence. Mark Huckleberry Finn made that up, and the new atheists believed it. Or Mark Twain made it up in the mouth of Huckleberry Finn. Um, the Atheist Empire, which is a website, .com, says, simply put, faith means belief or trust. Okay, we're good so far. 
Faith is a particular kind of belief. It is strong, it is often unwavering, and it does not require proof or evidence. Most would agree that belief in, uh, is faith when it is quite strong and does not involve evidence or practical reasoning. So if you have any evidence or practical reasoning, then if, if you believe in something based on that, it can't be faith. Um, Julian Baghini again says, When such grounds for belief are available, we have no need of faith. It is not faith that justifies my belief that drinking fresh, clean water is good for me, but evidence. It is not faith that tells me it is not a good idea to jump out of a window of tall buildings, but experience. Think about that for a second, that quote. When such grounds for belief are available, we have no need of faith. It is not faith that justifies my belief that drinking fresh, clean water is good for me, but evidence. Do you have evidence, you know, non-questioned evidence every time you take a glass of water and drink it? Or is it not true that you can't really tell except somebody told you this water is okay to drink? Is that not true? Unless he's got, you know, electron microscopes for eyes and can see what the protozoa, um, you know, are in that water, he has taken somebody's word for it, right? So it seems to me that when he says it is evidence, well, evidence given by what? I mean, you could have just tested the water supply. You still don't know if maybe the glass that you're drinking out of it, drinking it out of, had pollutants in it. You are basing it upon somebody else's testimony to you. So what is evidence? And he says, it's not faith that tells me it's not a good idea to jump out of the windows of tall buildings, but experience. When was the last time you jumped out of the window of a tall building so that you know that's a bad idea? I mean, I could argue from the skeptic David Hume who says just because something, cause and effect has been a certain way in the past, there is no philosophical justification to say that it's going to be true the next time it happens. All right? That's skepticism, which is, you know, the philosophical approach of skepticism, which is one of the things that new atheists believe. So you're, it's not actually your experience that you're basing it on. It's what you read or were told. You might have seen, I mean, how many of you all have ever seen somebody jump out of a tall building? And yet, you're pretty sure it's a bad idea, right? Because you heard it, you saw it, you read it. You didn't do it. So Baggini, in his illustrations, demonstrates the fact that it is not personal experience. It is not uncontrovertible evidence that causes him, but rather the testimony of someone else. How is that different than religious faith? Why are they setting up this dichotomy? Do you understand where I'm going with that? Yes. Terry. Just the last person that I saw at the front of the child Billy was saying that they, as he was going down, I heard him say, so far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they always say, they always say, I don't mind falling. It's the sudden stop at the end that gives me trouble, right? What we get into there is what constitutes warranted belief or justified belief. In philosophy, knowledge is defined as justified true belief. And the question is always, you know, true belief means that it, it needs to be true if you believe it. But what constitutes being justified? Alvin Plantinga, who I'm going to quote a little bit later, who is, I think, widely considered the greatest living philosopher. And he is a Christian. Um, he's Reformed Church, like Presbyterians, but Reformed Church. He almost single-handedly reintroduced natural theology as a philosophical discipline. Nobody would have thought that's possible, but he's that good. I had the great privilege to have a course from him when I was at Fuller. He was a visiting professor called um, Reason and Belief in God. He has done a trilogy of books all based upon the question of warranted Christian belief. Warranted, meaning what is the evidence that we base our belief on? And that evidence doesn't mean I was alive 2,000 years ago and I saw Jesus walk on water. There are other evidences. But in the same way, with, I would insist that Jules, uh, Julian Baggini has not himself jumped out of a window. And he has not, right before he swallows it, done a microscopic analysis of that glass, you know, that water. He is, his warranted belief that it's a bad idea to jump out of a tall building window or to drink, you know, bad water is entirely based upon testimony from somebody else. And yet, we would all say the same thing. We would all believe that's warranted. We climb on an airplane and we fly to the States. On what do we base our belief that that's a safe thing to do? 
Okay, we trust the pilots, we trust the major airlines. You know, they're, everything we do every day that we consider reasonable, rational, and warranted are all ways of making statements of faith in something. And the, for us to do that with religious belief is no different than anything else. And yet, the new atheists set that up as a strict dichotomy, that religious belief is fundamentally different than other kinds of belief. And that's a false dichotomy. Um, in fact, whenever they suggest that you know, faith has no evidence, faith has no grounds of belief, if you look at the definitions, like in the OED, the Oxford um, English Dictionary, it's like saying that um, it's not faith that justifies, well, they say it's not faith that justifies my belief. The, the new atheist would say, I'm a scientist or I'm a whatever, Christopher Hitchens wasn't a scientist. But the scientist would say, it's not faith that justifies my belief. If you really take the definitions of those words seriously, that's like saying it's not belief that justifies my belief. Because faith and belief are defined as basically the same thing. They are the definitions of one another. Um, the equivalent would be, you know, my, it's not belief that justifies my belief, or it's not faith that justifies my faith. Those words are interchangeable in term in anybody else's understanding of those words. Okay, I sort of beat that to death. Now, there's an extent to which, um, see, Dawkins, who believes that religion causes evil, Dawkins once said, if children were taught to question and think through their beliefs instead of being taught the superior virtues of faith without question. It is a good bet that there would be no suicide bombers. I agree. I absolutely agree with him on that. I don't think that we should raise our children to accept what we tell them at a certain age. You know, I mean, when they're tiny kids, then they need to do what they're told. But at a certain point, they need to say, what do I believe for myself? And we should encourage that. They need to think. We need to teach them to think. They need to make their own decisions about these things. So I completely agree with that. The problem is, that he's assuming that when we, when we inculcate faith in children, that we expect it to be accepted without question forever. And we'll come back to that. Christopher Hitchens said, if one must have faith to believe in something, then the likelihood of that something having truth or value is considerably diminished. John Lennox makes the point that assuming that Christopher Hitchens has... Um, faith that Christopher Hitchens really exists, then the fact that he believes in himself, has faith in himself existing, significantly diminishes the likelihood that he truly does exist. This is an illogical statement. It is inherently inconsistent. For one thing, it's a statement of faith. Any statement like this that's a, uh, that's a bald statement about something being true or not true, based upon just somebody saying it, that's a faith statement. Okay, there's no other way that you can read that. He is making a statement of what his belief system is, which is his faith system. And followed through to a conclusion, it gets quite ridiculous. For instance, you cannot have science without the assumption of certain things. The process, do we have any scientists in the group, anybody who's actually practiced science as a profession? The, the basic way of doing science is on experience or whatever, you come up with a premise, a hypothesis, it's often called. This is what I expect to have happen. And then you test it. And then based upon the evidence that comes from that test, you modify your hypothesis, you may modify your experiments, and you continue till you get to the point where saying, the evidence leads me to believe that this is true. Okay. But just start out with the assumption first that the world is an intelligible place. And that what you experience, you really can believe in evidence. All of that is faith-based. Christopher Hitchens went so far as to say that the really silly thing, our belief is not belief. It's not a belief. Our principles are not a faith. Our belief is not a belief. Yellow is not yellow. There is no reason to that. It is an irrational thing for him to say. It is not logical, um, and yet he gets away with it, and people think he's, he's very smart about that stuff. One of the problems we run into goes back to Immanuel Kant. How many Germans do we have here? I'm oh, sorry, Bob. Um, Immanuel Kant is the most important modern philosopher. You know, I, 
When we taught at classes, I've always teased about how the German theologians get us in trouble and Bob Finke was always offended because he's German. Um, Immanuel Kant is the most critical, the most important of all modern philosophers. In ancient times, there was pre-Socrates and post-Socrates. In modern times, and by the way, it was early 1700, not late, I said late 16, early 17. He was born in like 1724, I looked it up. Um, I was asked yesterday, what, when was Kant? Um, Immanuel Kant, modern philosophy is before Kant and after Kant. He is that significant. His critique of pure reason is almost certainly the most important philosophical work ever done. But, <laughs> Kant once said, I have found it in critique of pure reason. I have found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Now here's one of the greatest thinkers that ever lived. Unfortunately, people have misread that. They've taken that quote out of context. You have to look at, at it in the whole context of the critique of pure reason. And many people have taken Kant to mean that if there were convincing evidence for the existence of God, then there would be no room left for faith. You don't need faith if you have evidence. And if you're going to have faith, you have to get rid of the evidence. You can't, you have to deny any knowledge you have in order to have faith. Well, that's, if you read Critique of Pure Reason or Critique of Practical Reason, you know that Kant was not one to set aside knowledge. And yet, they, Immanuel Kant has gotten us into trouble on that sort of stuff. People think he means, you can't think about this stuff too much, because then you can't have faith, because faith is different than knowledge. Faith is not based upon evidence. Um, I'll give you an example of that. All the research that has been done about smoking causing lung cancer, right? Smoking does cause lung cancer. Nobody, and we could say, well, that's absolute evidence. There's absolute proof of that. Does that mean everyone, that that, that, that leaves no room for faith and that everyone accepts the fact that they should stop smoking because it's going to cause lung cancer? Okay, the, the relationship there, people often will say, well, I don't believe that. I don't have faith in that because of what they want to do. Human beings are, it's not that clear cut as Dawkins and Hitchens and those guys would want it to be. But faith, the people who do believe that and say, I'm going to stop smoking. I mean, how many people stop smoking or try to stop smoking? Because they believe the evidence. They have faith in that evidence. I'm sorry, but I, I was not actually participating in those experiments. But ordinary, everyday people believe what they were told about that. They believe the evidence is there somewhere, even though they didn't produce it. Um, and, and they will act, they will make decisions in their life based upon the evidence that they were told about. Now let me get back to that warranted faith thing in Julian Baggini and the story of Doubting Thomas. Um, Baggini and uh, Andre and Dawkins and all these guys believe that Mark Twain is right, that faith is believing in something you know ain't true. Well, one of their interpretations from that, they look at the Christian Bible and they say, see, they say it themselves. And they use this passage. Um, A.C. Gray and Baggini specifically have done sort of commentaries on this, and I'll tell you how they say it. This passage, John 20. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, the twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where his nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas, very simply, had not had the evidence that the others had seen. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Julian Baggini's interpretation of this passage is, See, Christianity endorses the principle that it's good to believe what you have no evidence for. And it's a rather convenient maxim for a belief system for which there is no evidence. He looks at last verse. Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet have believed, and says, see, Christianity encourages people to have no evidence, and yet still believe. Do you think that's a fair interpretation of that passage? Jesus did not condemn. Thomas always gets a bad rap, by the way. People always call him Doubting Thomas. He was only asking for the same level of evidential experience, or experiential evidence, you could say it either way, that everybody else already had, to actually see there is in Christ. 
And Jesus did not hold that against him. They said, he said, Thomas, put your finger in my hand, like you said. Put your hand in my side. See that it's really me, and stop doubting. Accept the evidence, Thomas. And Thomas, having seen the risen Christ, didn't need to actually do that. Jesus knows that after his ascension, after the death of all of those people that experienced him, for, his, for faith in him to continue, people were going to have to believe based not on seeing him, putting their finger in his hand, their hand inside, but rather on the testimony of others. The thing that Bagini and others do not take, it, you know, take into account is that immediately after this passage in John, chapter 20, John writes this, this goes through uh, verse 29, starting in verse 30, John writes this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John is saying, I am giving you this witness as evidence so that you can believe. There is other kinds of evidence besides just seeing for yourself. In the same way that Begini did not actually jump out of a tall building to say that his experience told him you shouldn't jump out of the window of a tall building. In the same way that he says, I know that uh, drinking clean water is good and I can drink this water because I was told by a reliable um, testimony that this is clean. He didn't actually do it himself. We did not actually see Jesus. But there is evidence beyond sight, including the testimony that we have, and as C.S. Lewis once said, nobody reads the scripture and believes that it's just like anything else. Even people who don't agree with it or don't like it recognize there's something very special about this. And there's something very special about the person it's about, Jesus. So there is other kinds of witness. It is not a matter just of um, you know, their interpretation that, well, this means Christians don't want evidence. They don't want to accept evidence. There's somehow you get extra points if you accept it with no evidence. No, Jesus just said, people are not going to see me. Not, they're not going to have evidence, right? Terry Eagleton is a literary critic. He has been a critic, I've read his stuff a lot in the past uh, in literary theory. He's a, um, written a lot about postmodern literary criticism. A lot of the early postmodernists got into linguistics and literary theory. He wrote a book called Reason, Faith, and Revolution, and it's a critique of the New Age movement. He's been a big critic of the New Age movement. He is widely regarded as, a, as one of probably the primary British modern literary critic. Okay, in, in, liter in liturgy, in some of his texts, he's written like 25 books, some of his texts are the standard text in literary criticism. He said, I'm going to give you several quotes because I really like this guy. Terry Eagleton said, Dawkins considers that all faith is blind faith. And that Christian and Muslim children are brought up to believe unquestioningly. unquestioningly. Not even the dim-witted clerics who knocked me about in grammar school thought that. For mainstream Christianity, reason, argument, and honest doubt have always played an integral role in belief. And what he says there is very critical. There is such a thing as blind faith. The, the terrorists... Religious fundamentalists who strap bombs to their chest because somebody told them to and walk into a crowd and set it off, that's blind faith. They were promised that they would be in heaven and they would have virgins and, you know, a whole thing. <clears throat> There's no witness anywhere for that. They were just told that and they believed it. Blind faith is a dangerous thing and it is not what we're called to. But that word blind is very important. Blind faith is not the same as faith. And yet the new atheists would have you believe that. They don't feel the necessity to put the qualifier blind on there. They call all religious faith blind and stupid and irrational. And they are unjustified in doing that. They're setting up a straw man. Terry, uh, Terry Eagleton continues. Imagine someone holding forth on biology whose only knowledge of the subject is the book of British birds. And you will have a rough idea of what it feels like to read Richard Dawkins on theology. You read one book and you're an expert. Theologians read Dawkins' theological comments and go, where are you coming from? Philosophers read him and go, it is really unfortunate that you had any clue that you could write about philosophy. Because you're not a philosopher, you're not a theologian. And yet, obviously, as a critic of that, that's what he gets into. Uh, another quote from Terry Eagleton. I think I may know just about enough theology to be able to spot when Richard Dawkins or Christopher Hitchens 
a couplet that I shall henceforth reduce for convenience to the solitary signifier Ditchkins, is, taking, is talking out the back of his neck. That's a British expression, means you have no clue what you're talking about. He's not a Christian. Terry Eagleton is not, I, I don't know if he has any theistic belief or not. He just is willing to recognize and point out when somebody is not making any sense. They're setting up straw men. Their definitions are not, are not definitions accepted by anybody else. Um, and to claim that all faith is blind faith, we would not have the expression blind faith if there was not some way to differentiate that from reasonable faith. We believe our faith is reasonable. And Alvin Plantinga, who's written three books, a trilogy, on what is warranted Christian faith, is entirely based upon the fact there is evidence. And how do we philosophically understand what is warranted faith versus what is unwarranted faith? And he declares that the biblical faith, the belief in the testimony that John's talking about, is warranted Christian faith. So we then, let's shift gears here, and we ask the next question. Oh, there's, there's Terry Eagle, and there's the first quote I gave you. Um, for mainstream Christianity, reason, argument, and honest doubt have always played an integral role in faith. And as, as I say, I'm not aware at all that Eagleton is a Christian. He's just an honest observer. So, is faith a delusion? We've talked about the fact we think faith is reasonable. There's a difference between religious faith and blind faith, and that's a false dichotomy that's been set up. But is faith a delusion? Richard Dawkins says in The God Delusion, faith is an evil precisely because it requires no justification and brooks no argument. He, the, the title of his book, The God Delusion, he believes that anybody who believes in God is delusional. Now, a rich, um, it's not the first time that Christians have been accused of that. In fact, in the book of Acts, the 26th chapter, Paul gets accused of that. In his presentation, this is before he's sent to Rome, uh, he's been in Caesarea for a couple of years, and he makes his, he's making his argument to uh, Portius Festus and to uh, Her King Herod Agrippa, who had come to visit Festus, who was the governor. And he's arguing the Christian faith and explaining what he believes. And it says in verse 24 and 25, At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. You're delusional. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. It's not delusional. It's true and reasonable. And yet, Dawkins and these guys, and Sigmund Freud, this goes back to Freud, declared that religious belief, faith, especially the Christian faith, is a delusion. So where do we get that word? The word delude is from the Latin deludere, which means to play false or mock or deceive. It originally meant to deceive the mind, to deceive the mind or judgment, to cause what is false to be accepted as true. But nowadays, delusion almost always is meant to refer to a psychological or psychiatric illness. A mixed, a fixed false belief or a persistent false belief against strong contradictory evidence, especially as a symptom of psychiatric disorder. So if you say somebody's delusional, it used to just meant you believe something that isn't true. Now it means you're sick in the head. You're suffering from a mental illness. Guillermo, would you go and ask them not that tell them we're sorry, but they need to not be hammering quite so much. Uh, we're building a wall up there, so we'll have a secure place we can put food and clothing and stuff as we gather it for distribution. So this, as I said to you before, Dawkins calls anyone who has faith a faith head and believes they are delusional. That's why The God Delusion is his best-selling book. He believes that faith is a form of insanity. So is it? Again, Dawkins is not the first one to come up with that. Um, Festus accused Paul, accused Paul the Apostle of being insane, of being delusional. As part of this, a, comp a comparison that Dawkins makes is that believing in God is the equivalent of believing in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. Because it's just as much of a delusion, it's just as much of a false belief. And that just like if you, if you're, when you become mature, you should get rid of believing in the Tooth Fairy or in the Santa Claus, you also, unless you're delusional, 
you should get rid of belief in God. Well, that's just silly. Alistair McGrath, I mentioned him earlier, he has three doctorates. The first of his doctorates is molecular biology from Cambridge. He's, he is the, um, a theologian now at Oxford on faculty. Pretty credible guy. And he writes this. As a child, I believed for a very short while in Santa Claus. <laughs> However, I soon sussed the real situation out, though I must confess I kept my doubts about Santa's existence to myself for some time because I also noticed that there was material advantage in doing so. <laughs> I have never heard of an adult coming to believe in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. I have known many adult people come to believe in God. So clearly, there is a great difference. But is it still worth asking the question, why is faith in the Tooth Fairy a delusion? The answer is obvious. The Tooth Fairy does not exist. And here we get into the question of uh, presuppositions. I suggested that earlier. The presuppositions that you have, what you assume to be true when you start, will dictate what your propositions in your logical arguments are. And if your presuppositions are in one way, your propositions will be different. And we, aren't, we don't study logic enough anymore, or reason, or argument, to be able to see when, when the presuppositions are slanted, and therefore the propositions and the argument are off or wrong. I'll give you an example of why I'm saying that about presupposition. In fact, there's a whole field of, of apologetics called presuppositional apologetics, which is based upon the idea that if you question, if you challenge the atheistic presuppositions and follow them to their logical conclusions, they are irrational. There's a whole field of apologetics in dealing with that. But we must say that faith might be a delusion, in fact, it would be a delusion, if God does not exist. Then we would be believing something that is not true. Faith in God certainly is a delusion if God does not exist. But what if God does exist? Do you see where I'm going with the presuppositions? Then, if God does exist, atheism is the delusion. So the real question is, does God exist? If he doesn't exist, then if we believe in him, we're deluded. If he does exist, then the atheists are deluded. So why might we be deluded in either direction? Many atheists inspired by Sigmund Freud claim that we believe in God simply because we are not capable of coping with the real world and the pain and the difficulty and the uncertainties in the world. This is the crutch theory. I once had somebody in town, I invited him to come to church. He said, well, I'll come to your church, but I don't really like these churches where the whole idea is that you need a crutch. And I looked him in the eye, and I know him pretty well, I said, do I strike you as somebody that needs a crutch? other than the fact we all need crutches. You know, we're all broken. I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But this idea that Sigmund Freud and the atheists now say that the only reason why religion exists is because we can't deal with reality, and we need something else as an excuse, a delusion that makes us feel better. Michael Onfray, again, says religion is imagined because people do not wish to face reality. Better the faith that brings peace of mind than the rationality that brings worry, even at the price of perpetual mental infant infantilism, meaning to be a mental infant forever. There's a German psychologist of considerable note named Manfred Lutz, and he has written that the Freudian explanation for God works very well, that it is a delusion because we can't deal with the problems in life, only provided God does not exist. But in fact, by the very same token, if God does exist, then the Freudian argument shows us that atheism is the comforting delusion. It is a flight from facing reality. It is a projection of our desire that God doesn't exist, so we won't have to meet him someday and give an account for our lives. That's very convenient. Um, a Polish writer who is a Nobel laureate, he received a Nobel laureate in literature, uh, Czeslaw Milos, who himself has suffered persecution, um, he said, a true opium of the people is a belief in nothingness after death. Remember the, the Soviet idea that religion is the opiate of the people, which is another way of saying what Sigmund Freud said and that Onfrey and these guys were saying, that you're only doing this because you can't deal with reality. 
So Seslal Milos says the true opiate of the people is a belief in nothingness after death. The huge solace of thinking that for our betrayals, greed, cowardice, murders, we are not going to be judged. There's the presupposition question. If God does exist, then atheism is the psychological escapism. It is the delusion. If he doesn't exist, then Onfrey and Freud and Dawkins are right. But there is no evidence from Freud either way, for instance. Um, Lutz, the German psychologist I quoted, he goes on to say that whether God exists or not, Freud is not going to help you figure that out. Freud, he accused all of us believers of having delusions. He does not give us a way that we can find evidence for the existence of God. We've got to look somewhere else for that. And yet, they quote Freud, you know, Onfrey and these guys, that you're just deluded. Well, maybe we're not. Maybe your presupposition is wrong. Maybe, Christopher Hitchens, you would have a very different idea about whether Christianity is moral if you did not have the presupposition that Jesus was only a man. For, if you, for just one second, could set aside your presuppositions that God is not real and therefore he could not have come to earth as a human being and to say, well, what if he did? You would have a completely different understanding of the atoning act of sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is your presuppositions that are keeping you from that. So the real question is, does God exist? I want to go back now to the question of faith and reason, but particularly with regard to faith and science, since Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris are all scientists. Three of the four you know, um, horsemen of the non-apocalypse were scientists. The three that are still alive. Dawkins died in 2011. Richard Dawkins insists that atheists have no faith, and yet no scientist could engage in science without believing or having faith in, first, the rational intelligibility of the universe. You understand that statement? And then believing in the evidence presented to him. In other words, if you didn't believe, if you didn't have faith in the fact that we are able to figure things out, that the universe has some rational consistency that can be discovered, if you didn't believe that first, if you didn't have faith in that, then you could not pursue science. Then, if you didn't have faith, believe in, accept the evidence of, what, what the science tells you, if you didn't have faith in the evidence, you couldn't be a scientist either. And yet Dawkins insists that scientists do not have faith. False definitions, again. Only not in terms of reason, but now in terms of doing the act of science. Paul Davis is a, a, a well-known theist, who, or a physicist, who is a non-theist. He is not a religious person. He does not believe in God. But he very correctly has said, science can proceed only if the scientist adopts an essentially theological worldview. Even the most atheistic scientist accepts as an act of faith the existence of a law-like order in nature that is at least in part comprehensible to us. If you don't believe that, don't have faith in, don't believe that all of this in some way is put together in a sensible way that we can investigate and learn about, if you don't have faith in that, you cannot do science. You cannot be a scientist. And honest scientists, like Paul Davis, are willing to admit that. Science has to have faith. And if you don't believe that, let me quote another scientist, mathematician to you. Science and math are sisters. I think you heard of him, Albert Einstein. Now, Albert Einstein was not a Christian, commonly misunderstood, because he made statements about, about um, God or religion. Albert Einstein said, science can only be created by those who are thoroughly imbued with the aspiration towards truth and understanding. So far, so good. This source of feeling, however, springs from religion. Now Dawkins is having heartburn. To this, there, be there also belongs the faith, notice the word. There belongs the faith in the possibility that the regulations valid for the world of existence are rational. That is comprehensible to reason. That's what... Uh, Davis just said, I cannot imagine a scientist without that profound faith. Once again, Albert Einstein uses the faith word. The situation may be expressed by an image, 
Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. Dawkins wets his pants every time he reads that, I'm sure. That Albert Einstein twice here in this quote refers to scientists having faith. And that science and religion both have a valid presence in the world. Stephen Jay Gould, very famous scientist, uh, died, died some time ago. He acknowledged that too. He was not religious at all, but he acknowledged that religion had its place. And Stephen Jay Gould proposed what he called non-overlapping magisterium. Magisterium is an area of authority. Okay. The Catholic Church calls all the, the leaders in the church, from the Pope and Cardinals and Bishops and all that, those are called a magisterium. So, when Stephen Jay Gould said that religion and, and uh, science should have non-overlapping magisteria, magisteria is the plural, he meant they both have their area of operation, and we need to let each of them operate in their arena. They don't have to agree with each other, they don't even have to overlap, but they both can exist, even though he was not a religious person at all. Well, Dawkins and Hitchens and others absolutely hate that idea. They do not believe religion has any place anywhere and should be done away with. They completely refute uh, Stephen J. Hawkins, or uh, uh, Stephen J. Gould's, maintaining that religion has a place in the world of human experience. All right? And it's also true that Dawkins hates it when religious people quote Albert Einstein. In fact, in The God Delusion, he identifies Einstein, in fact, he, uh, there's a quote here. He says that Einstein was, quote, repeatedly indignant at being called a theist. Dawkins insists he is an atheist. Or at the very most, he is a pantheist, meaning that all things are part of God. All right, which is about as little theism as you can have and still have that, you know, be it. But certainly he did not believe in a personal <laughs> God. So Dawkins says he was a pantheist. Well, Albert Einstein said, I am not an atheist, and I don't think I can call myself a pantheist. Dawkins doesn't want to quote that. Dawkins calls him a pantheist. In addition, Einstein further said, everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe. A spirit vastly superior to that of man, and one in the face of which we, with our modest powers, must feel humble. Sorry, Dawkins, but you're not as smart as Einstein was. In this way, the pursuit of science leads to a religious feeling of sort, of special sort, which is indeed something different from the religiosity of someone more naive. He was... Einstein was not a theist. He did not believe in a personal God. He was not a pantheist either, and he was not an atheist. So on the atheist and pantheist, he spoke very clearly, Dawkins is wrong. I believe that he was a deist. A deist is someone who believes that there is a God, but that God is not a personal God. He is either an evolutionary force, which is consistent with his idea that it's a spirit a, a manifest in the laws of the universe. A deist either believes that God is the evolutionary force that created things, but it's not personal. You can't have a relationship with him. Or else, God made everything, and then he went on a long extended vacation and didn't leave a forwarding number. You know, he went to Puerto Vallarta, and we don't know how to get a hold of him. Um, either one of those fit into deism. And I think from everything I've read, I would say that um, Albert Einstein was a deist. But a deist accepts that there is a God, just not a personal God. Dawkins cannot allow that. And so he refuses to acknowledge what Einstein himself said. And he insists on saying that he was a pantheist. Or, is it pantheist? Or, yeah, pantheist. I, I thought for a second, wait, was it panentheist? So you get that, that idea. And I, I quoted a minute ago the, I, the suggestion that uh, Onfray makes. Well, let's take a break. We're at a good breaking point, <laughs> so to speak. I mentioned to you the, the approach that Julian um, Baggini made to the, the Thomas story, you know, the Doubting Thomas story. Well, A.C. Grayling is another, he's an atheist philosopher. He presents some of the same basic ideas. In fact, he does a, a similar commentary on the Thomas story as a, to demonstrate the fact that Christians actually are against having any evidence for it. Completely unjustified. He said at one point, 
and I quote, making well-motivated evidence-based assumptions that are in turn supported by their efficacy in testing predictions is the very opposite of faith. Faith is commitment to belief in something either in the absence of evidence or in the face of countervailing evidence. No, it's not. Faith does not mean that you do it in the absence of evidence or in the face of countervailing evidence. I believe there is very good evidence and then they, they quote things like the, a misinterpretation of that Thomas passage. There is very good evidence for the existence of God, for our faith, and on the other side of that coin, scientists have to make assumptions about things that are faith-based all the time. That's sort of where we've been going. And I'll give you a quote. This is from Professor Sir John Polkinghorne. He is Sir John Polkinghorne because he, is, he was knighted for his, his contribution to quantum physics. He, is a, he was a professor, senior professor of quantum mechanics at Oxford. He, at retirement age, he stepped down from the professorship in order to, to get a theological degree and become a rector in an Anglican church. He is a man of great faith. And as a physicist, one of the highest rated physicists doing in his day, he's retired from that now, in Britain, in fact he was one of the professors of Alistair McGrath who has three doctorates, he writes, physics is powerless to explain its faith, and note his explicit use of the word faith, in the mathematical intelligibility of the universe for the simple reason that you cannot begin to do physics without believing in that intelligibility. You have to have faith that the universe is intelligible or you can't try to scientifically determine its intelligibility. And it's particularly true in quantum physics, I think. Um, you know, he's now Father Polkinghorne. And as Father Polkinghorne, he doesn't use sir, because when you're clergy, you don't use the knighthood. He was knighted for his, his work in quantum physics. In quantum physics, if you know anything about quantum physics, there is more about that we don't understand than we do understand. <coughs> that, you know, the Heisenberg principle. You can tell where a particle is or you can tell where it's going, but you can't tell both. The idea that quarks appear from nobody knows where and then they disappear and go nobody knows where. Quarks. They're a, they're, they're a quantum, the tiniest of all quantum mechanical particles. Um, that's the only evidence, by the way, that anybody's ever had for suggesting that there are multiple dimensions. So that's maybe where the quarks come from and where they go. Um, we have all kinds of theories. String theory, multiverse theories. We have things that there seems to be suggestion they're out there, but we can't actually find them. Dark matter. Why do we call it things like dark matter? Because there is so much there that we don't understand. And we take it on faith. We have the slightest of evidence something is there, and we name it, and then we talk about it like it's a real thing. Talk about faith. Well, John Polkinghorne was one of the preeminent quantum physics scholars in Britain. And there's been more, there, early on especially, there was more done in quantum physics in Britain than anywhere else. Um, and so, I think he knows what he's talking about. All of the research that has done requires faith, if you're to be a scientist. In addition to that, people talk about proof. What is the meaning of proof? Well, you can't prove that. John Lennox, the guy who wrote this book, is a theoretical mathematician. The guy who wrote Gunning for God, the one I'm quoting, that, that I'm using his material. I'm, I'm blatantly stealing his material. And he makes the point that it is only, mathematics is the only discipline in which proof is considered conclusive. When you do a proof for a mathematical theorem, it can either, they talk about it either being elegant or inelegant. But it, it either proves it or it doesn't. There's no part way. There's no semi-proof. There was a, a, I should find a cartoon sometime. It was one that was in like the New Yorker. And it's these guys in lab coats. And one of them standing back looking at a, at a whiteboard that this guy's writing on. He's got all these mathematical formulas. And then, it, and then there's a bracket in the middle that says, and then something really spectacular happens. And then he's got all this other mathematical stuff. And the other guy says, I think you might have a problem there in the middle. <laughs> because that's not how mathematics works. <coughs> in fact, Lennox in the book talks about that in um, having a, a, an argument was made in algebraic argument, it wasn't even a higher level, a solution to a problem and it had 10,000 pages of proof. 
And there was only a handful of experts in the whole world that could understand it. Now, that's mathematical proof. Mathematics is the only endeavor, and mathematics is a kind of science, the only endeavor in science where that sort of thing is done. Even in the hard scientists, hard sciences are, are physics and chemistry and biology as opposed to the soft sciences which are psychology and sociology and anthropology, okay? The things where you deal with data, hard data. Even in the hard scientists, there is no such thing, apart from mathematics, of having a conclusive absolute proof for something. They talk about a mathematical proof, and that has a very specific meaning. In every other science, when they talk about proving something, they are talking about what we, and you guys watch cop shows, I'm sure, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I mentioned that last week. When we talk about proof beyond a reasonable doubt, it means that sufficient proof that any reasonable person would come to believe that a certain claim is true. Our legal system is based upon, somebody is, is, can be found guilty of a crime, or innocent of a crime, based upon whether or not there is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Meaning, is there or is there not sufficient proof for a reasonable person to believe what is said about this person is true, that they did it or didn't do it. That is the burden of proof, it's called, that exists not only in the legal system, but in all of the sciences as well. So whenever Dawkins or any of these guys starts saying, well, you can't prove God, there's as much proof beyond a reasonable doubt based on history, based upon philosophy, based upon logic, based upon a lot of things, that God exists and that religious faith is reasonable and rational as there is in anything else. There is the same burden of proof and the same availability of proof for faith as there is the sciences. The suggestion that there is somehow a difference there is not held up in terms of how science is really done. And that's why Polkinghorne could say, guys, this is, this is all a big mystery. You know, and we have to have faith in order to even pursue the intelligibility of the universe. Um, atheist John Gray. I want to talk now about the implications of atheism. What, where do we go if we actually accept their premises? Well, where we go is to see that they are inherently... Uh, logically self-defeating, that the, the new atheists especially, but all of atheism, scientific atheism, is self-defeating. If you take their conclusion seriously, then they disprove themselves. John Gray is an atheist, and he says, Modern humanism is the faith that through science humanity can know the truth and so be free. But if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, this is impossible. The human mind serves evolutionary success, not Truth. Okay, what does that mean? Um, evolution says that human beings, that, that everything about us developed in the evolutionary process because it gives us an advantage for survival. Survival is the criteria. It is not the ability to find meaning or find truth. Our rationality according to evolutionary biology, was given to us in order for us to have a greater likelihood of surviving, not so that we can find truth. In fact, the very concept, and this is where John Gray is going, the very concept of truth is not available within evolutionary biology. If I am entirely a product of my genes, my selfish genes, having produced me from some pool of amino acids that collated into, you know, uh, microscopic organisms and all of that, then there's the issue of truth and falsehood, of good and bad, those things, there's never a place for that to sneak in. And so the very argument that the, um, the, the evolutionary biologists who are atheists say that our rationality leads us to the truth, faith doesn't give you truth. Our rationality gives us truth. Well, our rationality is a product of evolution, and there, there is no room for believing that truth is a product of evolution. Or the ability to find truth is a product of evolution. Alan Plantinga, I've mentioned him several times, one of the smartest men on the planet, I think. He, he writes, If Dawkins is right that we are the product of mindless, unguided, natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties. We have to doubt our own minds. And therefore, inevitably, inevitably, to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce. 
including Dawkins' own science and his atheism. His biology and his belief in naturalism would therefore appear to be at war with each other and in a conflict that has nothing at all to do with God. Set God aside for a minute. You're claiming that truth, meaning, is found purely by rational faculty. And yet you also argue that that rational faculty is a product of evolution. And evolution does not give you the latitude to make truth a goal. You're arguing against yourself. Your own system is saying that you can't get there from here. You see that? You get that from Plantinga's quote? Now, on the other hand, you have all of these brilliant people who are theists. They may be other things, but a lot of them are Christians. Sir John Polkinghorne, now Father Polkinghorne. Francis Collins, the head of the most significant scientific endeavor in human history, which was the Human Genome Project, mapping the human genome. You get William Phillips, who's an American Nobel Prize winning physicist. Sir John Houghton, who's professor of physics at Oxford, the director of the British Meteorological Office and head of the Nobel Prize winning panel for climate change. Sir um, Alistair McGrath, three doctorates, and on and on. These are people who believe that truth can be found because they believe there's a source for that truth. They have a way of explaining where, the, where our ability to perceive truth and where our uh, cognitive faculties that allow us to seek truth come from. Dawkins does not. Dawkins looks at these people, I mentioned this earlier, and he has written that these scientists who believe in God are, I quote, the subject of much amused, amused bafflement to their peers in the academic community. Well, John Lennox, who is a theoretical mathematician, he says, has it occurred to these new atheists that they might be the ones that create amused bafflement on the part of their fellows in the academy, as they call it, which is the formal community of academic people? And we have to say, based upon your evolutionary theory, on what basis do you believe that you can get any kind of rational intelligibility out of the universe? That's, there's no evolutionary advantage to be gained from that belief. And yet your theory is that only evolutionary advantage was, the criteria, was what caused us to be the way we are. Okay. Uh, Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner wrote a famous paper entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences. It's unreasonable. He's honest about it. You can't claim that, that evolution got us here. Um, when atheists assert that they believe the existence of God results from a misuse of reason, which they do. They say people believe in God because they misuse their, their reason, they're delusional, the reason isn't working right anymore. They inadvertently reveal that their belief, uh, reveal their belief that the faculty of reason is somehow designed to fulfill the purpose of discovering the truth. You get that? When they say that reason has been misused somehow and has brought us to a belief in God, and if we were using our reason right, we wouldn't believe in God, built into that statement is the idea that our reason was somehow designed to find truth and it's gone wrong. It can't have gone wrong unless it was designed in a particular way. But the finding of truth is not something that evolutionary biology would have allowed us to, to develop by itself. Now, we're not talking about developing a capacity that allows us to find food when no food's available, or to find water when there's none available. We're talking about philosophical pursuits. Nothing in evolution, evolutionary biology, the new atheist, tells us what gives us that capability. In fact, it tells us that the search for truth cannot be, it's in no way advantageous to us in terms of philosophical truth, and so therefore, they argue against that availability. J.B.S. Haldane was a chemist who many years ago said, and I quote, if the thoughts in my mind are just the motion of atoms in my brain, a mechanism that has arisen by mindless, unguided processes, then why should I believe anything it tells me? Including the fact that it's made up of atoms. If it's all just random, then why do we assume that it's reasonable? in any way this mean, means anything, if it's just chemicals, if it's just atoms. The evolutionary beliefs of the Dawkinses and the Dennets and the Sam Harrises of the world themselves argue against us being able to make any kind of reasonable evaluations. Why should we believe this? If it's all just random, there's no order, there's no plan, there's no design. 
then none of it seems to hold together. It has been said that reducing thought to nothing more than neurophysiology, in other words, what Haldane was saying, that just the chemicals and atoms moving around in my brain, if that's all thought really is, then it's, it's like, to quote R.A. Hollingwood about materialism, it's like writing itself a large check on income that it has not yet received. In other words, we're, we're making claims for it that it can't support. Not if we believe that it's just chemicals and atoms. Then meaning, truth, consequence, none of those things matter. That, that doesn't help us survive. The German philosopher Robert Speyman, who's an eminent philosopher, said that we are faced not with a choice between God and science, as the new atheists would tell us, but rather a choice between either putting faith in God or giving up altogether any idea that we can understand the universe. It's not either science or faith. It's either, I'm sorry, it's not either, uh, yeah, science or faith in God. It's either faith in God or just give up. Because... You can't get there from here according, if you, if you follow to the logical conclusion what these guys are arguing. If you eliminate God, there is no rational basis for science. In fact, there's no rational basis for truth. Without the belief that there is a design in there somewhere, it all falls apart. We might as well go home. There is no warrant. There is no justification for either science or the pursuit of truth or even rationality according to the evolutionary biologists. You, you guys get that? I keep saying the same thing because I want to make sure you understand that. It's critically important. Um, and so, what have we been talking about? We start off with the fundamental truth that atheists make their argument that faith is irrational by changing the definition of faith and claiming it is something that nobody else claims it is. That it is without warrant, without evidence, without justification. That's not the definition of faith. So that's one thing. Secondly, they claim they don't have faith. Well, faith is a synonym for belief. If they have no faith in anything, then they could not pursue science because they have to have faith that the, the universe is intelligible and they have to have faith in the science, the evidence that they produce from their scientific efforts. They have faith. So that goes back to the fact that their definition of faith must be wrong. They do have faith. As scientists, as thinkers, um, Christopher Hitchens is famous for saying that people of faith are assassins of the mind. Well, in fact, the new atheists are assassins of the mind, to use his phrase, because their atheism, if you follow it epistemically, meaning in terms of how do we know things, then their atheism is blind to any arguments from outside. It is actually anti-science. You can't do science if you actually believe the things they're saying. And it's not coherent. It is not logically consistent. It argues against itself. So, I think the upshot is, if you look at all of this, the idea of rationality and faith, etc., it's not faith in God that's the delusion. It's actually the concept of faith that the new atheists have put forward that's a delusion. They are the deluded ones because they've redefined everything so that they can then argue against it. But their definitions are not true. Their presuppositions are false. And the propositions they make in their arguments based on that are false. Given their, given their if, if you accept their propositions, then many of their conclusions are correct. If it's true that Jesus was only a man, an itinerant preacher 2,000 years ago, and we killed him in order to make it better for ourselves then Christopher Hitchens would be right. That was immoral, and we shouldn't accept that. But if it was God himself who did it to himself for our sake, that's a very different presupposition, and that's a very different presupposition and a very different proposition, and we come to a very different conclusion. That's true all the way down the line, with the definition of faith, with the definition of reason, with an understanding where evolutionary biology arguments take us, and we're going to argue, talk about that a little bit more and talk about science and faith. Um, one last thing I want to show you. Uh, this is, what I'm about to show you is from a man named John Humphreys. He is a BBC um, on-air presenter, they call him a presenter. He's a, like a news guy. And he has done a lot of interviews with these new atheist guys and is very frustrated with them. He wrote a book called In God We Doubt. 
because he's not himself a theist. He's an agnostic. He admits he doesn't know. But he's a smart enough guy and honest enough that he looks at the new atheists, many of whom he's interviewed on the BBC, and, get, and says, these guys are clueless. And he, he has a seven-point statement of what they're saying, and then his response. First, he says, the new atheists say that believers are mostly naive or stupid, or at least they're not as clever as the atheists. Well, um, Humphrey, Richard, uh, John Humphreys replies this way. This is so clearly untrue, it's barely worth bothering with. Richard Dawkins, in his best-selling The God Delusion, was reduced to producing a study by Mensa that purported to show an inverse relationship between intelligence and belief. In other words, more intelligent people believe less. He also claimed that only a very few members of the Royal Society, this is the Royal Society of Science in England, that's the, the equivalent of our American, um, American, what's it, American Academy, Academy of Science? Sciences. Okay. Um, that very few members of the Royal Society believe in a personal God. Humphrey says, so what? Some believers, are un some believers are undoubtedly stupid, but I've met one or two atheists I wouldn't trust to change a light bulb. <laughs> what does that prove? And you can say, well, the majority of the, the Royal uh, Society's members are not believers. And then you've got Francis Collins, John Polkinghorne, and Alistair McGrath, and on and on. Okay? The second point that Humphreys quotes the New Atheists. The few clever ones, they're talking about the New Atheists saying this about believers. The few clever ones are pathetic because they need a crutch to get them through life. Humphrey says, don't we all? Some use booze rather than the Bible. It doesn't prove anything about either. He's questioning their propositions. You know, he's, he's giving us their conclusions, but he's backing it up and saying, wait a minute. There's something wrong with the way you're setting up the argument in every one of these cases. Third, the atheists say about Christians, they are also pathetic because they can't accept the finality of death. Response, maybe, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. Count the number of atheists in the foxholes or the cancer wards. There's an old saying, there are no atheists in the foxholes. The, Im the immediate arrival of death tends to give people a very different religious perspective on things. I wish Christopher Hitchens had come to the faith before he died. His younger brother is a, is a Christian. So, and they were, they were separated um, from each, you know, they were not related, they were not talking to each other. They were not getting along for a long time. But not too long before his death, Christopher Hitchens and his brother got back together. But his brother's a Christian. He's a journalist too, but he's a believer. The fourth statement, they, the Christians, have been brainwashed into believing. There's no such thing as a Christian child, for instance, just a child whose parents have had her baptized. This is a big deal for Dawkins. There's no Christian children or Muslim children. There's only, only children whose parents are either Christian or Muslim. And they should be allowed to make their own decision later. Humphrey's response, that's true. And many children reject it when they get older. But many others stay with it. He's questioning the premise. Fifth, they have been bullied into believing. Response, this is also true in many cases, but you can't actually bully somebody into believing, just into pretending that they believe. And so eventually, if you're right, they'll get over it. Why are you screaming about this? Number six, if we don't wipe out religious belief by next Thursday week, civilization as we know it is doomed. This is a big thing with Sam Harris and some of the others too, but Sam Harris was inspired by the 9-11 events. And so much of it is he's saying that, that if necessary we should execute people with radical religious beliefs to keep them from doing bad things. Humphrey's response, of course the mad mullahs are dangerous and extreme Islamism is a threat to be taken seriously, but we've survived monotheism religion for 4,000 years or so, and I can think of one or two other things that are a greater threat to civilization. <coughs> Number seven, trust me, I'm an atheist. Why? Okay? You can give me all the conclusions you want, all the logical, supposedly logical conclusions. I'm going to back up and ask the questions about your premises. Based on what premises and what propositions do you say that? And Humphreys adds Riley, I make no apology if I have oversimplified their views with this little list. It's what they do to believers all the time. 
<laughs> he's not a Christian. He's an about, you know, as he states he's an agnostic. He wrote a book called In God We Doubt. But he's smart enough and honest enough to look at what all these guys are saying and doing and saying, that ain't right. You guys are not being fair. You're not being honest with it. And so you need to back up a step. And he does very tongue in cheek. He points that out. He questions their premises. Whereas they only want to focus on their conclusions. Questions about any of that? There's a lot of stuff there to question. I know I've covered a lot of, a lot of things today. I hope I haven't gotten too deep into some stuff. Um, somewhere in this course, are you, uh, will you uh, eventually touch on um, the faith of Abraham in Romans 4? I was just looking at that. Abraham believed God in spite of the evidence that he did not deny. Every time he looked in the mirror, he saw a hundred-year-old wife and his wife. And, and yet he, he chose to believe something that was beyond the image that he saw in the mirror. Right. And will that be addressed somewhere down the line? Not in this class. And the reason because this is a response to the new atheists. See, these guys have... Well, see, these guys, these guys are telling, if I understand correctly, these guys are saying that Christians deny the physical evidence in front of them. And I would contort, or, or, or respond by saying that Abraham did not do that. Abraham saw the evidence, he saw the physical limitations of his own weakness as, a, as an older man, and yet he chose to believe in something that was beyond what was tangible before him. Yeah. Um, I mean, that may come into it, but again, this class, as opposed to, to the first apologetics class, and some of the other, you know, some of the biblical classes, things like that too, that we've done, uh, the new atheists are writing best selling books all the time. They are getting people to follow them. The reason why I'm doing a class just on this is the more and more I studied and read it, um, their, their statements and how people are responding to them, I realize that it is one of the greatest challenges thinking people have today to their faith. Whether people don't have faith yet and we want them to give faith a fair hearing, or whether they have faith and they're being caused to question that faith. These guys, men and women, guys is a generic you know, neuter term. Um, they're writing things and saying things, and they sound very smart. Their arguments seem to be based in science, they seem to be based in reason, and a lot of people are getting at least confused or actually drawn away from the faith because of it. So this class is intended to deal with that because this is one of the great modern challenges we have to the faith. There are a lot of other things I could go into, but again, in terms of the positive arguments, why we believe what we do from a rational point of view, an intellectual point of view, that's much more the first apologetics class, where we dealt each week with a different kind of approach to faith and belief. I'm really trying to focus in this class. Now, the last, the la before the conclusion class, so the seventh week, I am doing a class on evidences for God, where I'm going to say, you know, let's back up from what these guys are saying for a minute, and let's spend two hours talking about some of the rational reasons why we do believe. We'll get into some of that as we, as we disagree with them. But I'm going to try to stick with, here's what, that's why I'm quoting them so much. Here's what these guys are saying, and they're best-selling authors, and they're getting on TV shows, and they're being asked to do documentaries, and on and on. We need to know why we don't think they're right. Okay. Now, I may get into some of, some of those biblical examples, um, but I'm, I'm trying to stick with, here's how we're responding. And let me tell you one, another reason why I'm doing that. In the first apologetics class, the last lecture I did was on the New Atheists. And um, it was only an hour lecture. It was like before we took the test. And I got into it very superficially. And I received an email from a woman, a long email from a woman, who really raked me over the coals. You know, have you really read their stuff? Are you, did you get this all from Wikipedia? I don't have a problem with Wikipedia, by the way, if they've got the references. Um, <coughs> Do you, you know, and I talked about the fact that Daniel Dennett has launched, launched and is maintaining the clergy project where he's trying to, bless you, he's trying to provide support for Christian ministers or other ministers now, it started out as just Christian, um, ministers of other religions now, who don't believe anymore. They don't believe in God anymore. He's trying to provide them support. Even the many of them who are, as he said, there's a don't ask, don't tell kind of policy and who will not admit it because they have to keep their job. And so they're still getting paid by the church. They're still getting a pulpit every week. 
and struggling to figure out how do I make this work without going nuts. And so he's trying to encourage that, encourage them, support them. Well, I said, you know, in my first lecture, I think there's a dishonesty. If every week you're getting up and you're purporting to be a Christian minister and you've decided you don't believe it anymore, that that's dishonest and you need, you, you need to deal with it, whatever the consequences are. And this woman who wrote to me, long email, she said, how uncompassionate can you be? Well, there's probably some truth to that. Okay, I, we need to, doesn't mean it, it's okay for them to, in effect, every week lie about it. You know, saying they believe something they don't, or even worse, in some cases, they announce that they don't believe in God anymore and they take it as their responsibility to convince everybody else not to believe in God, which in some cases, that's what they do. Um, that's, you know, that's not okay. But at the same time, I probably should have spoken with more compassion about somebody who finds themselves in that situation. So her accusations were, for the most part, not completely, but for the most part, were well-founded. And that's one of the reasons I thought, you know, I didn't do them justice. And this is a major sort of thread of thought in our Western culture right now that affects Christianity and it affects our faith. And I need to do better service to it. And so I, you know, I'm reading, I have been reading. And am reading still, because there's a lot of it, what these guys wrote. God delusion, you know, the end of reason. Um, I'm reading that stuff. I'm not going to give that to you on a bibliography, because some of you would be fine. Some of you might not be well equipped philosophically to deal with, or theologically to deal with some of that. Um, so I'm not going to recommend those books to you, but I'm going to read them. And I had not read very much of it before. I'd mostly read quotes and excerpts. Well, I got the books. I can show you my Kindle. I've got The God Delusion and The End of Reason and uh, uh, Darwin's Dangerous Idea from Dennett, you know, and I read a lot of it. I'm reading, reading it all the time in pre preparation for this. So I at least can say I'm trying to do them justice. So I'm going to try to stick with that rather than because we've got 300 other hours of lecture where we dealt with a lot of these other things online. For this class, I'm going to try to stick with that stuff. Is that fair? Because I do think this is huge. This is a big deal. We are so impressed with science these days and with people with multiple degrees. You know, Oxford professor. Who doesn't go, oh, Oxford professor? Um, well, these guys are like that. Does that mean that we go along for the ride or do we need to step back and say, here's why I don't agree with them? Reasonably. Generously, respectfully, he's right to scream. Yes. Okay, just one <coughs> quick comment. I don't know who was even, it's a comedy, uh, there's two, Anchorman 1 and Anchorman 2. Uh, anybody seen those movies? It's, it's Will, what's his name? Yeah. 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 Anyway, the, it's kind of a spoof where they invent a news media, kind of like CNN, but it's called GNN. And the real uh, success factor is built upon not logic or reason or on real news, real facts, real truth, but based on, as, as the key actor wrote or whatever the name is, suddenly described uh, the idea, give them what they want to hear. Comedy, road races, police chases, this kind of thing. Feed them whatever they'll take and, and bubble up. Yep. And, and I think maybe that's part of the reason the, the new atheists are so successful. It's something different, something new, and it sort of uh, simplifies people's lives if they think and they accept what they're hearing. They're hearing you know, something that suits with them, and so I'll, I'll go with that. Well, I remember what you know, Milos and some of the others said, is that to people who maybe have grown up thinking there is a God, and I'm not being the kind of person I should be, and I'm going to be to be told, oh, don't worry about that. In fact, I mentioned before the bus campaign that they had in, in London, in Britain, but London especially, that Dawkins helped fund. It was a bus campaign and billboards, and it said, there is no God! Now go and enjoy your life. That was the whole message. Well, for a lot of people, they want that to be true. They want to think, I, don't, I can do whatever I want if it feels good, and if I'm not breaking any laws, there's no consequences. People have always felt that way. The idea that I want, to, I want to focus on satisfying my own appetites. Well, the new atheists give them permission to do that. Okay. So tell Apart from the morality that's necessary for the survival of the species, which they, that's how they try to explain morality, um, they would say, 
you know, do whatever you want. If there is no God, go and have a good life. Enjoy yourself. Multiple girlfriends, that's okay. Downside. As long as they don't shoot you, you're okay. Um, and so I think there's that some of that is we want to hear it. Some of it is that we're impressed with those things. Science is one of the things that most people who don't have any bad scientific background, they think that it's scientism, they think that is the source of all truth. These guys are scientists for the most part, so they must be right. There's a lot of pieces of that. But we need to be able, and you don't have to have a PhD, you don't even have to have a, you know, a master's degree in theology. All, of, all Christians, you know, the passage from 1 Peter 3, and then what, um, what R.C. Sproul said, we all have a responsibility. We were told that we need to be prepared to respond for what we believe, the hope that is in us, when we hear that kind of stuff. When you have a son or a brother or a sister or a neighbor who says, oh, you know, like Richard Dawkins said, blah, 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 you know. Are you ready to talk about what you believe? Not to argue them into submission. That's not the point. To do it respectfully and gently. What do you believe? What that's has God done for you? That's the issue. What do you believe as contrasted to what do you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I brought up Romans 4. Because, because that is the basis for the belief in which one can respond to these arguments. Not just what you know. What you know it is, depends on your ability and your cleverness to be able to convince someone with opposing evidence. But what you believe, that is what makes, in my, my thinking, is what makes a strong, powerful defense that Peter was talking about. First. Right, well there's the personal, I mean when you're witnessing, there's the personal relationship part of it, but the idea about what you believe, that's one of the, one of the belief is one of the exchange words for faith. And and though they believe in they believe in science too. I mean, they're, that, that's the the point of a lot of what I was talking about, especially in the first hour. Is is belief? We all have scientists, atheists, everybody. We have some sort of belief structure. And as Christians, our witness is: here is what God has done for me. Here is what here is why I believe what I believe. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But we also may need to be prepared to answer their questions in order. You know, we're, you're not going to argue somebody in the kingdom of God. But you may be able to tear down some of the barriers that they have built up because they read Richard Dawkins or read an article that, you know, by Sam Harris or whatever. You may be able to, to pull down some of the bricks and the barriers so that the voice of the Holy Spirit, they can hear it through the gaps. And so we need to be prepared to do that too. Now there's a difference between what we're talking about here in terms of giving a reason for the faith that we have in us. That's a different part of our witness responsibility than sharing the love of Jesus in our life, what Jesus has done for me. It's not, it's two halves of the thing. It's not exactly the same thing. This class is focusing on more the reason side, okay? the, the, the rationality of the thing. And that's not to diminish the rest of it, but when you start mixing those things together, I don't think you get a clear picture of either side. And so we've had other classes where we dealt more with the, you know, the worship class right now. How many of you? Some of you all in the worship class, you know, where we're talking about our personal relationship with God and what that means and how we share it corporately. That's a different thing than the reason that we have for what we believe. Those are all different pieces of the faith. They come together, but in order for us to learn them well, we sort of have to take them apart and, you know, dissect them and work on them. Fair? Yeah. I'm going to let you guys go a few minutes early. Because I'm tired, and it's my birthday, and I'm going to go to dinner with my wife. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Boy. Happy birthday, dear Ross and Carolyn. Happy birthday to you. Okay, you got better there at the end, but when you started, I was going to say, uh, the choir's full. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm just kidding. That truth meaning is found purely by rational faculty. And yet you also argue that that rational faculty is a product of evolution, and evolution does not give you the latitude to make truth a goal. You're arguing against yourself. Your own system is saying that you can't get there from here. You see that? You get that from Plantinga's quote? Now, on the other hand, you have all of these brilliant people who are theists. They may be other things, but a lot of them are Christians. Sir John Polkinghorne, now Father Polkinghorne. Francis Collins, the head of the most significant scientific endeavor in human history, which was the Human Genome Project, mapping the human genome. 
You get William Phillips, who's an American Nobel Prize winning physicist. Sir John Houghton, who's professor of physics at Oxford, the director of the British Meteorological Office and head of the Nobel Prize winning panel for climate change. Sir um, Alistair McGrath, three doctorates, and on and on. These are people who believe that truth can be found because they believe there's a source for that truth. They have a way of explaining where, the, where our ability to perceive truth and where our uh, cognitive faculties that allow us to seek truth come from. Dawkins does not. Dawkins looks at these people, I mentioned this earlier, and he has written that these scientists who believe in God are, I quote, the subject of much amused, amused bafflement to their peers in the academic community. Well, John Lennox, who is a theoretical mathematician, he says, has it occurred to these new atheists that they might be the ones that create amused bafflement on the part of their fellows in the academy, as they call it, which is the formal community of academic people. And we have to say, based upon your evolutionary theory, on what basis do you believe that you can get any kind of rational intelligibility out of the universe? That's, there's no evolutionary advantage to be gained from that belief. And yet your theory is that only evolutionary advantage was, the criteria, was what caused us to be the way we are. Okay. Um, Nobel Prize winner Eugene Wigner wrote a famous paper entitled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. It's unreasonable. He's honest about it. You can't claim that, that evolution got us here. Um, when atheists assert that they believe the existence of God results from a misuse of reason, which they do. They say people believe in God because they misuse their, their reason, they're delusional, the reason isn't working right anymore. They inadvertently reveal that their belief, uh, reveal their belief that the faculty of reason is somehow designed to fulfill the purpose of discovering the truth. You get that? When they say that reason has been misused somehow and has brought us to a belief in God, and if we were using our reason right, we wouldn't believe in God, Built into that statement is the idea that our reason was somehow designed to find truth and it's gone wrong. It can't have gone wrong unless it was designed in a particular way. But the finding of truth is not something that evolutionary biology would have allowed us to, to develop by itself. Now we're not talking about developing a capacity that allows us to find food when no food's available or to find water when there's none available. We're talking about philosophical pursuits. Nothing in evolution Evolutionary biology, the new atheist, tells us what gives us that capability. In fact, it tells us that the search for truth cannot be, it's in no way advantageous to us in terms of philosophical truth, and so therefore, they argue against the, that availability. J.B.S. Haldane was a chemist who many years ago said, and I quote, if the thoughts in my mind are just the motion of atoms in my brain, a mechanism that has arisen by mindless, unguided processes, then why should I believe anything it tells me? Including the fact that it's made up of atoms. If it's all just random, then why do we assume that it's reasonable? In any way this mean, means anything. If it's just chemicals, if it's just atoms. The evolutionary beliefs of the Dawkinses and the Dennets and the Sam Harrises of the world themselves argue against us being able to make any kind of reasonable evaluations. Why should we believe this? If it's all just random, there's no order, there's no plan, there's no design, then none of it seems to hold together. It has been said that reducing thought to nothing more than neurophysiology. In other words, what Haldane was saying, that just the chemicals and atoms moving around in my brain, if that's all thought really is, then it's, it's like, to quote Ari Hollingwood about materialism, it's like writing itself a large check on income that it has not yet received. In other words, we're, we're making claims for it that it can't support. Not if we believe that it's just chemicals and atoms. Then meaning, truth, consequence, None of those things matter. That, that doesn't help us survive. The German philosopher Robert Speyman, who's an eminent philosopher, said that we are faced not with a choice between God and science, as the new atheists would tell us, but rather a choice between either putting faith in God or giving up altogether any idea that we can understand the universe. 
It's not either science or faith. It's either, I'm sorry, it's not either, uh, yeah, science or faith in God. It's either faith in God or just give up. Because you can't get there from here according, if you, if you follow to the logical conclusion what these guys are arguing. If you eliminate God, there is no rational basis for science. In fact, there's no rational basis for truth. Without the belief that there is a design in there somewhere, it all falls apart. We might as well go home. There is no warrant. There is no justification for either science or the pursuit of truth or even rationality, according to the evolutionary biologists. You, you guys get that? I keep saying the same thing because I want to make sure you understand that. It's critically important. Um, and so, what, what we've been talking about. We start off with the fundamental truth that atheists make their argument that faith is irrational by changing the definition of faith and claiming it is something that nobody else claims it is. That it is without warrant, without evidence, without justification. That's not the definition of faith. So that's one thing. Secondly, they claim they don't have faith. Well, faith is a synonym for belief. If they have no faith in anything, then they could not pursue science because they have to have faith that the, the universe is intelligible and they have to have faith in the science, the evidence that they produce from their scientific efforts. They have faith. So that goes back to the fact that their definition of faith must be wrong. They do have faith as scientists, as thinkers. Um, Christopher Hitchens is famous for saying that people of faith are assassins of the mind. Well, in fact, the new atheists are assassins of the mind, to use his phrase, because their atheism, if you follow it epistemically, meaning in terms of how do we know things, then their atheism is blind to any arguments from outside. It is actually anti-science. You can't do science if you actually believe the things they're saying. And it's not coherent. It is not logically consistent. It argues against itself. So, I think the upshot is, if you look at all of this, the idea of rationality and faith, etc., it's not faith in God that's the delusion. It's actually the concept of faith that the new atheists have put forward that's a delusion. They are the deluded ones because they've redefined everything so that they can then argue against it. But their definitions are not true. Their presuppositions are false. And the propositions they make in their arguments based on that are false. Given their, given their if, if you accept their propositions, then many of their conclusions are correct. If it's true that Jesus was only a man, an itinerant preacher 2,000 years ago, and we killed him in order to make it better for ourselves then Christopher Hitchens would be right. That was immoral, and we shouldn't accept that. But if it was God himself who did it to himself for our sake, that's a very different presupposition, and that's a very different presupposition and a very different proposition, and we come to a very different conclusion. That's true all the way down the line, with the definition of faith, with the definition of reason, with an understanding where evolutionary biology arguments take us, and we're going to argue, talk about that a little bit more when we talk about science and faith. Um, one last thing I want to show you. Uh, this is, what I'm about to show you is from a man named John Humphreys. He is a BBC um, on-air presenter, they call him a presenter, he's a, like a news guy. And he has done a lot of interviews with these new atheist guys and is very frustrated with them. He wrote a book called In God We Doubt because he's not himself a theist, he's an agnostic, he admits he doesn't know. But he's a smart enough guy and honest enough that he looks at the new atheists, many of whom he's interviewed on the BBC, and, get, and says, these guys are clueless. And he, he has a seven-point statement of what they're saying and then his response. First, he says, the new atheists say that believers are mostly naive or stupid, or at least they're not as clever as the atheists. Well, um, Humphrey, Richard, uh, John Humphreys replies this way. This is so clearly untrue, it's barely worth bothering with. Richard Dawkins, in his best-selling The God Delusion, was reduced to producing a study by Mensa that purported to show an inverse relationship between intelligence and belief. In other words, more intelligent people believe less. He also claimed that only a very few members of the Royal Society, this is the Royal Society of Science in England, that's the equivalent of our American, um, American, what's it, American Academy, Academy of Science? Sciences. Okay. Um, that very few members of the Royal Society believe in a personal God. 
Humphrey says, so what? Some believers, are un some believers are undoubtedly stupid, but I've met one or two atheists I wouldn't trust to change a light bulb. <laughs> what does that prove? And you can say, well, the majority of the, the Royal uh, Society's members are not believers. And then you've got Francis Collins, and John Polkinghorne, and Alistair McGrath, and on and on. Okay? The second point that Humphreys quotes the New Atheists. The few clever ones, they're talking about the New Atheists saying this about believers. The few clever ones are pathetic because they need a crutch to get them through life. Humphrey says, don't we all? Some use booze rather than the Bible. It doesn't prove anything about either. He's questioning their propositions. You know, he's, he's giving us their conclusions, but he's backing it up and saying, wait a minute. There's something wrong with the way you're setting up the argument in every one of these cases. Third, the atheists say about Christians, they are also pathetic because they can't accept the finality of death. Response, maybe, but it doesn't mean they're wrong. Count the number of atheists in the foxholes or the cancer wards. There's an old saying, there are no atheists in the foxholes. The immediate arrival of death tends to give people a very different religious perspective on things. I wish Christopher Hitchens had come to the faith before he died. His younger brother is a, is a Christian. So, and they were, they were separated um, from each, you know, they were not related, they were not talking to each other. They were not getting along for a long time, but not too long before his death, Christopher Hitchens and his brother got back together. But his brother's a Christian. He's a journalist too, but he's a believer. The fourth statement, they, the Christians, have been brainwashed into believing. There's no such thing as a Christian child, for instance, just a child whose parents have had her baptized. This is a big deal for Dawkins. There's no Christian children or Muslim children. There's only, only children whose parents are either Christian or Muslim. And they should be allowed to make their own decision later. Humphrey's response, that's true. And many children reject it when they get older. But many others stay with it. He's questioning the premise. Fifth, they have been bullied into believing. Response, this is also true in many cases, but you can't actually bully somebody into believing, just into pretending they believe. <laughs> and so eventually, if you're right, they'll get over it. Why are you screaming about this? Number six, if we don't wipe out religious belief by next Thursday week, civilization as we know it is doomed. This is a big thing with Sam Harris and some of the others too, but Sam Harris was inspired by the 9-11 events. And so much of it is he's saying that, that if necessary we should execute people with radical religious beliefs to keep them from doing bad things. Humphrey's response, of course the mad mullahs are dangerous and extreme Islamism is a threat to be taken seriously, but we've survived monotheism religion for 4,000 years or so, and I can think of one or two other things that are a greater threat to civilization. <coughs> Number seven, trust me, I'm an atheist. Why? Okay? You can give me all the conclusions you want, all the logical, supposedly logical conclusions. I'm going to back up and ask the questions about your premises. Based on what premises and what propositions do you say that? And Humphreys adds Riley, I make no apology if I have oversimplified their views with this little list. It's what they do to believers all the time. He's not a Christian. He's an about, you know, as he states he's an agnostic. He wrote a book called In God We Doubt. But he's smart enough and honest enough to look at what all these guys are saying and doing and saying, that ain't right. You guys are not being fair. You're not being honest with it. And so you need to back up a step. And he does very tongue-in-cheek. He points that out. He questions their premises. Whereas they only want to focus on their conclusions. 